Hello, my name is Nir Ayal, and uh, this is me that you see here in this photo. Uh, today I'll be talking about behavior change and matching the right change method with the behavior type you're trying to change. So um, I research and write and consult about uh, behavior change and specifically habit forming technology. Uh, my blog is nearandfar.com, as you can see there in the lower right. And I recently published this book called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, uh, which is available uh, on Amazon. And you can learn more, of course. Uh, there's more articles if you're interested about this content of the presentation on my blog, nearandfar.com. So let's dive right into the subject matter today. The question we're going to start talking about here is uh, this question around, are we matching the right behavior with the right tool. So if you can think about the behavior type as your bowl of cereal, and the change method would be a, f wait a minute, oh, wait a minute, I must have uh, put in the wrong slide here, I'm sorry, because there's a four, oh, wait a minute, that's right, okay, it's a spoon. So as you can see by that example, obviously we're not gonna eat a bowl of cereal with a fork, we're gonna eat a bowl of cereal with a spoon. And that's a great analogy for, I think, how uh, we wanna make sure we, we match correctly the right change type with the right change method. And so I'm going to show you how to match the, the, the spoon with your bowl of cereal, so to speak, for this metaphor around changing behavior. Before we dive into that, let, let's uh, kind of look at um, a great model for thinking about what drives human behavior, in particular habitual human behavior. So uh, there's a, there's a, a, a long-standing um, kind of metaphor for how the, the mind works. And this is proposed by uh, Haidt back in 2006, who proposed that really the human brain, uh, we, we, you know, we have one brain but two minds, that we can think of this great metaphor of human action being driven uh, by the impulsive mind as represented by an elephant. And on top of the elephant is the rational mind, our writer. And of course, there's also the environment, the things that shape the path on which the elephant uh, is, is walking. And so the writer is very conscious, is, is uh, verbal, is thinking, it's a thinking brain, and the writer is directing the elephant, but of course the elephant is much, much stronger, and the elephant drives automatic, emotional, uh, visceral decisions, and is much, much stronger when push comes to shove than the writer might be. And of course, the path limits where the elephant can go and uh, highly influences their behavior as well. So with that metaphor in mind, let's take a look at what I propose here is this matrix of behavior types. So in this matrix, what I, what I propose is that we can classify certain behaviors along this matrix of behaviors that we do and behaviors that we resist doing on the y-axis and then on the x-axis, behaviors that require a low amount of self-control or willpower or a high amount of self-control or willpower. And what we find is that we get these four different behavior types of amateur, skillful, habitual, and addictive behaviors. So let's dive into each one of these and what the differences might be. So amateur behaviors I define as behaviors that we do which require low self-control. And let me tell you what defines, I think, uh, amateur behaviors. These are behaviors where the rider and the elephant are basically in sync. They pretty much want the same thing. They're easy to do, uh, but they're also very easy to forget. They're, uh, they're about rewards driven and process motivated, and it's about the, the love of the doing. It, they feel inherently pleasurable. And these things are things that we tend to do over the long term. Now, some examples of amateur behaviors might be learning a new technology. That's why the symbol for that I use for amateur behaviors is this email inbox, because it's a behavior that we all do, uh, or many of us check email a lot. It's a, it becomes a habit, and that's a big part of what I study around habit-forming technology. So learning a new technology, you know, if you think about how you learn Facebook, or how you learn to use Twitter or Instagram, nobody ever forced you to learn these products, probably not, you learn them on your own because they were pleasurable to learn, because they required small steps to, to learn these, these actions. And, uh, and both you know, your conscious brain and your, your, your um, elephant, so to speak, uh, were aligned 
in this behavior because it was inherently rewarding. And so we can find that so other we find amateur that behaviors, other... behaviors also take on this pattern of an amateur behavior. Things like taking our vitamins every morning or weighing ourselves on the scale or uh, flossing our teeth or playing a sport that we actually enjoy. All these are examples of amateur behaviors that we learn over time. They're pleasure driven. Uh, we, you know, we enjoy the process of learning them and we're aligned with our rider and elephant uh, with these behaviors. So the way we create an amateur behavior, and many of these amateur behaviors of course can be very healthy for us, uh, the way we create these amateur behaviors is to really create a path for the elephant. It's really about um, uh, simplifying uh, the, the triggers and the path by which the elephant and the rider walk together. And so that it's really about making that behavior simple and easy, placing well-timed cues, and making sure that, that we are taking baby steps towards that goal. So much of my work in habit-forming technology, and if you think about the technologies you use every day, they really work in this arena of small steps by which we learn over long periods of time uh, how to do these relatively complex behaviors like checking uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You know, we learn lots of different steps to use these products and they're done slowly by shaping our path, by making the behavior as simple as possible. So that's, those are examples of amateur behaviors. Let me give you some examples of skillful behaviors. Now skillful behaviors are again doing, they are things that we want to do as opposed to resist doing, where a high degree of self-control is required. So what defines skillful behaviors is where the rider is now steering the elephant. The elephant uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily want to go the same direction. These are outcome driven. They're goal driven. It's not about the process per se. It's about a particular goal in mind, which is di very different than the amateur uh, behaviors where it's really about the process driven. It's for the enjoyment of, the, of, of taking that journey of, of, of learning that skill. Skillful behaviors are, are different. They're all about goal-driven, outcome-driven behaviors. So what's required is hard work, grit, and persistence. Examples of skillful behaviors might be learning to, to master a game like chess or an online game, right? really learning to, to beat that game. Uh, learning to become a writer right? requires a lot of, of skill and diligence and grit, and it's not always fun. Learning a musical instrument or learning to be a uh, a great engineer, perhaps. These are all examples of skillful behaviors. And what's required to create a skillful behavior is deliberate practice, focusing on fixing failures, a focus on grit and persistence, and oftentimes because they require high willpower, because they require a high degree of self-control, unlike the amateur behavior, they require coaching. Because again, these are behaviors that are not fun all the time. They require, they have these, these difficult humps to get over, and so oftentimes we need external factors to help us get over the difficult parts. Some examples of, of proponents of these skill for behavior me uh, um, uh, change methods would be, uh, if you've read The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle, or you know many of us have heard about the, the 10,000 hour rule as described by Malcolm Gladwell, Angela Duckworth describes many of the, the, the aspects of grit and persistence. And Joshua Four, he's, he's not a uh, behavioral specialist, but he talks about in his great book, Mo Moonwalking with Einstein, uh, how he won a memory competition uh, through this pra process of deliberate practice, of grit and persistence to get through this goal, and he talks about how oftentimes he needed coaching. Now, what's interesting is that amateur behaviors can become skillful behaviors. So if you think about the example of running, as an amateur, you may want to run for the casual enjoyment. Maybe the goal is the enjoyment of the process of running, the, the, the actual endeavor of running day to day, and maybe your only goal is to continue doing it into old age. Whereas someone who's looking at running as a skillful behavior, their goals are very different. It's not about the enjoyment of the practice. It's about the goal. Winning a marathon, finishing a race, completing that task. Very different mindset. And that affects how we think about the, the amount of self-control required to achieve those behaviors. So those are the two uh, behaviors in the top of the behavior change metrics, the do uh, part of the matrix. Now let's look at things that we resist doing. 
So behaviors that we resist doing that require low, a relatively low amount of self-control, and by the way, I should mention that each one of these is contextually specific for the person who's changing behavior. So to what some people might be a behavior that requires low willpower, low self-control, might for other people require a high degree of self-control. So this is very much for each and every person in their specific context. So let's talk about for a minute habitual behavior. So these are things that we resist doing that require a relatively low amount of self-control. What defines these habitual behaviors are that these things are typically negative things. We, we, we seek to resist these things. This is where the writer, right, the, the, the thinking mind, tries to control the instinctual brain tries to, to redirect what the elephant is doing. The elephant wants that candy bar, and yet the rider is trying to pull the, the elephant away. And it's not that hard. It's relatively easy. However, it's a, it's a situation of constant temptation, right? It's a constant struggle with wanting, with desire to resist that behavior. So some examples might be uh, you know, what, what I mentioned earlier of resisting unhealthy food. It's not impossible. Many of us can do it. It's not a high willpower action, but resisting uh, on any given occasion unhealthy food is a relatively low willpower behavior. Or some people crave very much this desire to constantly check their devices, checking email. Now, resisting that desire to check email at any one moment is not easy, but it's doable. It's a relatively low willpower behavior. Uh, nail biting, for example, or uh, buying a deal, if we see a great deal here in the lower right corner, uh, resisting that impulse might be classified as a habitual behavior. It requires low willpower, and it's something we, we want to not do, it's something we want to resist doing. How do we resist habitual behaviors? Well, there's a number of, of methods, and again, this is all about matching the behavior change method with the type. So the way we would uh, stop doing habitual behaviors is through mindfulness, through surfing the urge by creating space, the 10-minute rule. That's a, a rule that I often use when I want to do something that requires a relatively low amount of willpower, but sometimes just telling myself, I can do that thing, I can have that junk food, I can check my email or Twitter if I do it in 10 minutes. So by creating a little bit of space to surf the urge, that provides enough distance to then regain that self-control that's required. A uh, reminder of purpose is a great tool of why you're resisting that behavior. And then, of course, uh, the big one is self-compassion. That even when we trip up, studies have found, and we'll talk about this in a minute, that being compassionate about your failures is very, very effective in uh, who is able to actually resist these habitual behaviors. Some leading scholars and authors that uh, have written about how to resist habitual behaviors. Kelly McDonagall has a great book called The Willpower Instinct. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, on mindfulness, which is a very, very powerful technique that's been shown to be very effective in resisting certain behaviors. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn has been uh, a proponent in his uh, great book, Full Catastrophe Living, around mindfulness that kind of started this whole mindfulness movement. So highly recommend that you, you check out those works. And then finally, let's talk about the, the, the final quadrant here around addictive behaviors. So addictive behaviors are, again, behaviors that people resist doing, we don't want to do, but require a very high degree of self-control. So unlike the, the resisting of these habitual behaviors that are relatively easy to control, addictive behaviors are very hard to control. So what defines an addictive behavior? This is where the rider has lost control. The elephant is charging, and the elephant defines where the rider goes. These behaviors are self-destructive, and they are extremely hard to resist. So addictive behaviors such as chemical dependencies on nicotine or alcohol or gambling addictions or uh, full-fledged technology addictions these things are not something that uh, the, the sufferer can just all of a sudden stop. No matter how much willpower they might have, it's very difficult to stop cold turkey. Uh, and and the, the uh, rates of falling off the wagon and continuing these behaviors is very, very high um, because it's the, these behaviors are extremely difficult to resist. So 
resisting these addictive behaviors, how do we actually stop doing these behaviors successfully? Well, it's really about reining in the elephant because again, it's the elephant that's in control that's driving these behaviors. It's the instinctual brain. So here, it's not about um, you know small steps. It's not about resisting sometimes. What's proven most effective is complete abstinence, is detox, right? Physical de detoxification sometimes. A high degree of social support. High willpower behaviors, just like the skillful behavior of doing, addictive behaviors require a high degree of social support. And then, of course, root cause analysis. Uh, many times these addictive behaviors are done in order to uh, satiate deeper emotional needs. And so really understanding what those root causes are helps us to understand why these behaviors might occur and why it's difficult to resist doing these behaviors. So there we have it. We have our four behavior types of amateur, skillful, habitual, and addictive behaviors uh, along these, this grid of doing behaviors and resist doing behaviors, and then along the x-axis of behaviors that require a low degree of self-control and high degree of self-control. And then once we have these behavior types, now we can, we can attach the change methods. So to create a doing behavior that requires low self con or a relatively low degree of self-control, that would be all about creating the path, right? When it comes to a doing behavior that requires a high degree of self-control, it's about training the rider to push the elephant. It's about coaching. It's about commitment and grit and perseverance. On the bottom half, to resist doing a behavior, we want to train the rider to pull the elephant, to pull the, the elephant away from that path that they want to be on. Um, and that requires surfing the urge and mindfulness and self-compassion. And then the big technique for, uh, for resisting addictive behaviors is to fully rein in the elephant, right? Uh, there's a complete different technique there. And so what we, what we learn from these four different change methods, when we look at how different the techniques are for doing and don'ting versus uh, low willpower and high willpower behaviors, we find that for each one of these behaviors, the type of change method is completely different in each quadrant. And that's a, that should be a big aha moment. That should be something that, that, that I think most people don't realize that actually there is no one size fits all here. That if we read the latest book and we listen to the latest guru that's telling us how to change behavior, we have to be mindful of, well, what behavior is that method best at changing? Because if we create a mismatch, we have all kinds of problems. And let me tell you, let me show you a little bit about what happens when we mismatch behavior type with behavior change method. Let's look at how we think we're supposed to lose weight in America. America has an obesity know that, epidemic uh, America today. America today has an obesity uh, epidemic uh, today. Weight related. And, and let's ask ourselves for a minute. Uh, issues uh, are the what, number what one we're doing cause about it. Of and, death and, and today is what we're of, doing of, for people uh, under 50 in terms of changing our behavior, matching the right behavior change method. Well, let's let's think about this for a minute. What do we learn from the popular media is the right way to lose weight, to get into shape? Well, what we often hear is no pain, no gain. Don't quit. Set strict goals and abide by those goals. Hold yourself accountable. That somehow we see shows fat like is, The Biggest is, Loser, is a, is where a, people who uh, are obese is a, is a failure a center of will, where is a failure uh, skinny of, people of, and nutritionists uh, and the trainers to tell them one's actions. what to do it's just and an uh, overall guide their every action. Failure. And, and so that, that is the message apparently that the way that many people who are overweight wait here, right? Of course, this press. method is the right way and to get what back we, in shape. What right? we do then, as popularized by the media, we send people to the biggest loser. doesn't work so well. We send people to fat camps where we've seen time and time again that even people who have skinny people on shows like the biggest loser how fat they are and how they to work weight. harder and in fact and get their quickly. mental so in, in uh, the case of, of uh, uh, contestant after contestant even if they lose hundreds of pounds we see that within a few years time they gain back the weight well why is that well because going to a center and having a coach to reach a defined goal many of the of the people in the audience will recognize what type of behavior this is that's a skillful behavior Right? It's about an end goal where we have coaching. It's about grit and perseverance. And that works while you're at the center, while you're in the confines of that skillful behavior. 
But here's what happens when people leave. Their lifestyle, achieving a healthy lifestyle, is not a skillful behavior. It happens over a lifetime. It's an amateur behavior. It's not a skillful behavior. Unless you're training to go to the Olympics, health is not about this end goal. It's about small behaviors every day. It should be an amateur behavior, not a skillful behavior. Because we have to do small things like physical activity. More important than physical activity is actually eating the right foods. And these are small things that we have to do properly every single day. A healthy lifestyle is also about the things we don't do, the habitual behaviors that we don't do day in and day out. These are both on the left-hand side of the matrix. Things like eat, resisting eating unhealthy foods and resisting overconsumption of, of, of too much food. So as you can see, a healthy lifestyle and getting in shape is really should be on the left-hand side. These are small things we do every day without a distinct goal, without a distinct um, uh, purpose in mind. It's something we want to do for the rest of our lives. We know dieting works, or does not work, I should say. Dieting does not work because it has a finite goal. And so when people lose the weight, it tends to come back the vast majority of the time within two years period. Because, these are, they're, because people think of weight loss as a short-term skillful behavior as opposed to a long-term amateur or habitual behavior. And that's, that's where we're mismatching the right way to change our behavior. So another thing that, that we know about what happens when we mismatch the behavior change type with the behavior change method is that we, we get what's called reactants. Uh, it's the psychological phenomenon that when people feel controlled, they, they rebel. And what they tend to do is beat themselves up. So when they fail along the skillful side of, of the behavior change metrics, uh, when, they, when, they, uh, when those behaviors don't work, people tend to beat themselves up. So uh, drinkers who, uh, who felt bad about the fact that they had a drink the night before tend to drink more. They don't, the, the, the fact that they feel guilty doesn't actually help them get back on track. When they try and have these distinct hard goals, even though they should be doing amateur behaviors, they tend to beat themselves up. Gamblers who feel most ashamed by their losses most li are most likely to chase the loss and keep gambling. Students who feel the worst about procrastination put off studying the longest. Addicts who feel most guilt about a minor relapse we're the ones most likely to have a major relapse. So what we see here time and time again is that negative self-judgment leads to worse results by creating bad feelings. And, and we can see this uh, really epitomized by this great study around what's called the what the hell effect. That in this case, dieters and non-dieters were asked to drink a milkshake as part of a taste perception study. Actually, it wasn't a taste perception study. That's what they were told. And then they were asked to sample as much ice cream as they needed. So they, they had a milkshake, and then they were asked to sample ice cream. Well, you would think that the dieters would be the ones to take the least amount of ice cream, right? They had a milkshake already. Now all the reason they would, they would have the ice cream is to help this study, this taste perception study. But it turns out that what the study really wanted to determine was what effect dieting would have on consumption. And it turned out that the people who were on a diet actually consumed more than the non-dieters. Well, and not only that, we know that areas of their brain associated with reward became more active in those people who were dieters as opposed to non-dieters. Well, why might that be? Well, it turns out that when we restrict ourselves, when we place these confines, when we try and make what should be an amateur behavior into a skillful behavior, as soon as we fall off the wagon, as soon as we leave the confines of a strict regimen, we get what's called the what the hell effect. These dieters had the milkshake, they were off the diet through the study, and they thought, what the hell, I'll have as much ice cream as I please. And what we find is that they had a lot more ice cream than people who were non-dieters. So this is a great example of what happens, how we backfire when we inappropriately match the behavior change method with the behavior change type. Um, because what's crucial to many of these of the appropriate self uh, appropriate behavior change methods is that there's an element of 
self-compassion, particularly with those that are low willpower behaviors, where you're not in the confines of a coaching environment. So for the low willpower behaviors, those on the left side of the, of the uh, behavior change matrix, we need a high degree of self-compassion, particularly because we're on our own. When it comes to the behaviors on the left-hand side of the matrix of um, amateur behaviors and habitual behaviors, we're doing it on our own. So we know that self-compassion is a key component of successfully changing those amateur and habitual behaviors. We know that students highest in self-compassion were the least likely to procrastinate. That self-compassion predicts likelihood of getting back on track after setbacks. That uh, taking a self-compassionate view increases personal responsibility for failure. That self-acceptance pre uh, predicts willingness to receive and act on feedback. And finally, that self-compassion associated with the joy of learning for its own sake is a key component of students who excel. So we know that for those low willpower behaviors, the ones, the behaviors that we try and change in ourselves, which frankly is most of our behaviors, few of us actually can go uh, afford, you know, to go to a camp to help us lose weight or need to go change an addictive behavior where we, where we need detox. The majority of, of normal healthy people's lives really live on the, the doing new behaviors and resisting other behaviors in that low self-control side of the matrix where self-compassion is very, very important. So in summary, remember about the rioter, the elephant, and the path, and these three components of what drives human behavior, and that before changing your behavior or trying to change the behavior of, of others, what we really want to do first and foremost is to identify the behavior type. Is this a doing behavior or a resist doing behavior? Is this a low willpower, low self-control behavior, or does the behavior require a very high degree of self-control? Once we can do that, once we can identify which of the four types of behaviors this particular behavior is, we can match it with the appropriate change method. So we can go look for the best of breed research, the best gurus, the best books on how to change that specific behavior. And we wanna make sure that we don't create a mismatch. We wanna match the right behavior with the appropriate behavior type. For every bowl of cereal, we wanna find the right spoon. Not a fork, not a knife, but the spoon. So thank you very much for listening. I would uh, uh, invite you to check out my blog, nearandfar.com, as well as my new book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and I wish you the best.